gospel in chapter 1. Chapter 1 of uh, John's gospel. I'm going to read a few verses here, and then we'll talk about it. Right in the very beginning of uh, John's gospel in chapter 1, the first verse says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness, darkness comprehendeth it not. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This is he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have we all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Okay, that's a good place to stop with that. And I just wanted to just get the kind of the, the mood and the context of what John is saying. So back in verse 1, when John says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We know from, we just read in the passage, that a little later he's going to say, uh, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So we know he's talking about Jesus. I mean, we already know that's what he means. So why didn't he say that? It's a good question, isn't it? Why didn't he just say Jesus was in the beginning uh, with God? That's, that's an interesting thing to, to ponder. What he, uh, instead, he says the Word. Now, when we read that, we... Uh, generally think of the word as meaning the Bible. And that's not bad. That's not a bad thing. But I don't think that's what John meant. I don't think he meant that in the beginning there was a King James Bible out in space floating around with God. I, you know, I don't think that's the image that he's trying to convey. In the Greek language, this word that's translated word is a Greek word that comes with a lot of baggage. It comes with a lot of... Uh, pre-existing ideas from the Greek culture that uh, John's readers, uh, at least if they were literate enough to read, they would have been aware of what this word logos is the word in the Greek language. And uh, as I said, if John's readers were literate enough to read, they, the, the, the philosophy of the Greeks was well known at the time. And John has deliberately chosen a word that comes with a lot of uh, implications. Uh, to me, it's like, a, like an icon on your computer. You know, anybody who's ever seen a, a Windows computer, you see on the screen, there's just a bunch of little pictures, right? But the picture, the little picture is not the whole story. You know, like if I look at my computer and it's got a little blue box with a W on it, the message is not a blue box with a W. The message is that this is a word processor, Microsoft Word, and there's a whole program underneath that with all kinds of details and all kinds of things about it. You see what I mean? But the icon is just like a little picture, but there's implications that if you're familiar with it, you understand when you see the icon. Logos as a word is like that. Um, in, in Greek philosophy, and I was just kind of looking it up this morning to see who started it, and it's not really clear. Uh, there's a Greek philosopher named Heraclitus uh, who's attributed to some of the ideas associated with it. Also, Plato is very uh, well known for one who used it. And the, the idea is that behind this physical world, beyond this physical world that we see and touch and perceive with our senses, is an unseen world, an unseen realm 
that is the ideal, the perfect, the true. And what we experience in this physical world is a mere shadow or a, uh, uh, an imperfect form of that. The be behind everything that we see is something that is pure and perfect and true. And I think that's what John is getting at here uh, about by calling Jesus uh, the Logos. He's saying he's behind it all. He's the perfection. And, but it's also an interesting idea because um, in, in the world of the Greek philosophy and the way they use that word, the idea is that the Logos is, is the perfection behind it all. But what we experience and what we see is imperfect. And um, a good illustration of it is um, if I say to you, uh, uh, circle, you can picture in your mind a circle. Is that right? Can you all imagine a circle in your mind? But if I say to you, now bring that circle in, into the form, into physical form, you could draw it on a paper. But you know what? Your circle that you draw on the paper is not going to be perfect. What you envision in your mind is perfect. Is that right? Yeah, you can visualize and you can, uh, the ideal circle is not really seen. And, and when you try to represent it, it's, it's imperfect. Um, Plato had this... Uh, this story called the cave, and you've prob probably heard it before, but I'll tell it in case you have it. It's real short, and uh, his 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 little parable of the cave goes that uh, pr imagine prisoners who are in a cave and they're chained to the wall and they're imprisoned there in this cave, yet on the opposite wall in front of them they can see shadows moving on that wall uh, that are cast from things that are happening outside the cave. But all they see are those shadows. And so they might be thinking, uh, for them, that's their reality. But, it, but in truth, all they're seeing are shadows of the true reality that they can't see. And so if someone were to come along and liberate them, and to free them, and to take off their chains, and bring them out of the cave into the light of day, now they can perceive what really is true. You see, and I think that's what... Uh, what uh, John might be hinting at here when he's saying in the beginning was the, the word, the logos, uh, the perfection uh, that underlies it all. And we know he means Jesus. But you see, a little later on, he says, the word was made flesh. Now, the realm of the flesh is the realm of imperfection. That's where we live. What he's saying is Jesus is God's way of bringing God's perfection into and invading this world of imperfection. And he even says, he even brings us into this and says, we, are, we who believed in him, we are born of him. We are uh, brought into this same kind of life that he's experiencing is what he's uh, implying here. Uh, look at something, uh, with that in mind, look at something that James says. This is in James chapter 1. Uh, I'm going to start with verse 16. This is James chapter 1, verse 16. He says, Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Verse 18. Of his own will he begat, uh, begat he us. Notice what he says. With the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And as you might guess here, when he, the word that's translated word is that same word logos. Um, but here's the other thing about it. Not only is does John and now James use the word word to describe the perfection and the perfectness of, of Christ as he comes into this realm of imperfection, by using the word word, he also is telling us that this, this subject that we're talking about can be communicated. This perfection that invades our world of imperfection. Uh, by using the word word, we're implying that it's something that can be uh, passed from one to another. And uh, John said that... Uh, to as many as received him, to them he gave the power, the privilege to become the sons of God who were born, not of the will of the flesh, the will of man, but born of God. 
Uh, he didn't explicitly say it there, but here James explicitly says that we're born of God by the Word, uh, the Word of truth. And just to make it simple, we, we hear the message of Christ. We hear the Word. And when we hear the Word and believe it, see, that's what John said, as many as received Him, to them who believe on His name. We hear about Christ, and we believe it. And now James says here that of his own will. That's what John said also. Uh, not of the will of the flesh, or the will of the man, uh, will of man, but of God. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. In other words, he used the word of Christ uh, to begat means give birth to. Give birth to something, something spiritual, something that's perfect, right within the realm of our imperfection. You know, this kind of sounds, I know this, I, I'm trying to, I want to make this a little more practical. Uh, it, it all sounds a little bit highfalutin and, uh, you know, intellectual double talk and that sort of thing. But see, I think this is important to understand that we live our lives in an imperfect environment. And, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, but we ourselves, in our fleshly experience, are imperfect. Now, I hope I don't have to convince you of that. Yeah. Uh, is that, is that self-evident enough to say that we are? See, I think that there are people in the world who think that I can't be a Christian because being a Christian means I've got to live up to some high standard of perfection that I don't think I can live up to. I remember thinking that myself. But it's not that God's sitting up in heaven tapping his foot and drumming his fingers on the table and saying, I'm just waiting on you to live up to my standard of perfection. No, he comes down into our realm of imperfection and plants his perfection right in the midst of our imperfection. That's what I think the, these writers are getting at. Every good gift, that, see, that's a good thing. It comes down from God. Uh, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. This is interesting now. Um, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. I heard one person say that most people... Practice this verse, but in reverse. Most people are slow to hear, swift to speak, <laughs> swift to wrath. Anyway, but James says, no, uh, swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. That would be a good thing to put on Facebook. <laughs> if, you're, if you're looking for something. <laughs> No, I, people are so angry. You ever notice how much, uh, how much uh, contentious uh, anger there is floating around in the world today? Uh, that's not uh, that's not the spirit of God. Um, the, all that anger and you know contention. The wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. That's so good. You know that'd be good enough to put up on a billboard. But nobody would care. <laughs> they just drive right on by. Oh, they're driving too fast anyway to stop and read it. But they raised. We were just talking before church about how they raised the speed limit, now, and it's still not. It's still not high enough for everybody. <laughs> no, you you out there on the on the highway driving. We were driving 75 on I-35. They've raised it, you know. And people were passing us like we were standing still. You know, we might as well have been parked. <laughs> anyway. No charge for that. That's all. That's all extra. Uh, verse 21. I love the King James translation. Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty words, isn't it? Uh, wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. And, and he says this means contrary. Why? In, instead and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Now wait a minute, I thought he just got through saying earlier that of his own will begat he us by the word of truth. Now he's saying uh, receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Well, um, it, uh, the only explanation I can offer is the fact that the word soul is is sometimes, you see, we use the word soul and spirit interchangeably in our everyday talk, but uh, in the Bible, often the word soul is, uh, it, it's the Greek word suke, from which we get our word psyche, and it has to do with 
uh, your, your mental, emotional, uh, the life of volition, the life of your choices. You know, the part of you that makes choices, makes decisions, and does thinking, rational thought, that's your suke, your psyche. Do you understand? That, you know what I'm talking about when I say that? The part of you that uh, decides I'm going to go this way and not that way, the part of you that decides I'm going to do this but not that, that's your psyche. And James is here saying, you as a Christian are begat or born of the word of truth, but now as you're, you see, uh, he didn't just begat you, if that's a word, uh, cause you to be born again by his word and then snatch you out of here and take you up to heaven. You're still living down here in this realm of imperfection. But he still has a plan to bring his perfection into this world of imperfection. And you are a participant, in, and your mind, uh, to use Paul's language, needs to be changed or renewed. And the same word uh, from which you are born or begotten, James is here saying, re keep on receiving with, with meekness. That means with humility. In other words, don't think you're so great that you don't need any further help from God. Uh, receive with meekness the engrafted word. That means, uh, uh, grafting means like you, you, you attach it or it's brought in, you see, the engrafted word. Like, you, you know, with trees, sometimes they graft one tree onto another. Um, the engrafted, he says it's able to save your souls. Now, instead of soul, think suke, my psyche, my thinking. It's able to uh, bring about a change and bring about uh, changes. You know, sometimes this word suke is translated life. You know, when Jesus gave a parable and he said, what will a man give in exchange for his life? That's suke. It could be, it's your life in this world is what it means. Uh, James is saying, this word from God is so powerful. Not only did it beget you, beget you, not only did it cause you to be born of God, but it's able to transform and change your whole life and bring about a revolution of God's perfection invading your imperfection. To, you know, and I, and I feel a little bit uneasy about drawing on a non-Christian philosopher, but it's like in Plato's cave, those prisoners who were chained to the wall, and if they're liberated and brought out into the light, that, James is saying that's what the word will do. It'll bring, it brings you out of that realm where you're just seeing shadows, now you can see how things really are. You see the reality of it. In fact, that's what Jesus said explicitly. Uh, uh, I'll tell you what, uh, Torn, could you give me this? We'll take a little sidetrack here. This is in John chapter 8. I think it would be good to look at this in this context. John chapter 8 and verse, uh, hold on, I'll tell you a second. Uh, 31. And this is a familiar verse. I know you've heard it, but just think about it in the context of what we've been saying. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, continue means go on. I mean, it means a process. Just like James said, receive with meekness the engrafted word. An ongoing continue implies an ongoing process. If you continue in my word, you see, we've just been looking at this idea that the Logos, this perfection of God that was in the beginning with God, that is really the, the whole uh, nature of Christ. He was in the beginning with God, and He was made flesh and dwelt among us. It's so powerful that when you receive it, it causes you to be born of God. But not only that, it's so powerful that it can, as you continue in it, what does he say? If you continue in my word, then you will be my disciples indeed. The next verse says, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. That reminds me of that story about the cave. He wants to bring us out of the place of where we just see shadows and see the reality, and see things really how, how they are. Um, here's another one. This is in uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Um, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, 
by the word of God. If you want to know what uh, Greek word is behind that, um, it's the word logos. Uh, same thing we've been talking about. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. You see, this is the very thing that John was talking about. Uh, in the beginning was the word, and it was with God, and it was God. He, he, this is just another way of saying the same thing. It liveth and abideth forever. It's eternal. It's the reality behind uh, the physical thing. It's God's perfection. And we're born again by that word. John, uh, Je, uh, who are we reading here? Peter. Peter says in verse 24, all flesh is grass. You see, it's always in contrast to this outer world, this flesh world. And he's saying, consider for a minute the difference. You're born of this perfection from God, this spiritual power that is the word. On the other hand, in this physical world, the flesh world, all flesh is grass. In other words, it's, it's temporary. It's, it's here today and gone tomorrow. All flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as the flowering of grass. In other words, something really trivial and passing temporal. All the glory of man is like a little flower that pops up on, on the grass. It said, the grass withereth and the flower there falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. He's saying we have been brought in contact with something that is eternal and uh, is going to last forever and is uh, secure and, and stable. Whereas all of this flesh world that people who are like the prisoners in the cave, that they think that's the reality, but in, but in fact it's just like grass. It's passing. The word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Get the idea? It's this this message, this, it can be conveyed by preaching, and we preached it to you, and he said, you were born again by this word. Now, the next thing is chapter 2. Peter didn't put chapter 2, of course. Uh, translators put that in later uh, to help us study it. So Peter just goes right on. And so now we're in chapter 2, verse 1, but as far as Peter is concerned, he's just writing his letter. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisy and envies and all evil speaking. This sounds a lot like James, doesn't it? You might think they were hanging out together. Uh, I think they were. Uh, Wherefore, laying aside all malice, all guile, hypocrisy and envies and all evil speakings. Verse 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. James called it the engrafted, receive with meekness the engrafted word. Now here, that's like a tree analogy. Now, Peter is using a little different picture, a little different analogy, but trying to get the same truth across. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. Why? That you may grow thereby. He doesn't mean grow physically like a baby. He means grow, well, how does he mean grow? Uh, inwardly, in your understanding and in your suke, in your perception of, of how things really are. See, I think if we perceived how things really are, do you, have you ever noticed Jesus in the gospel? You've read the gospels? You ever notice how Jesus behaves in the gospels? You ever notice how he's not ever shaken up by anything? Nothing ever catches him, you know, nothing ever, you know, you don't ever see Jesus saying, oh man, disciples, help me. <laughs> I don't know, what are we going to do? You know, they want us to pay the taxes. We don't have any taxes. Do you ever, you, he says, no, Peter, go down there and throw a wine in the water. First fish comes up, opened his mouth, and there was the tax money. You know, listen, Jesus saw things how they really were. How are those things? He was walking in the favor of God, born of the perfection of God. Even though he's walking in this physical, imperfect world, he knew, he says it constantly, he says, I know the Father. I know the Father. He knew that there was nothing to worry about, that there was no reason to get shook up because I know the Father. See, we could, if we, when we, see, that's why Jesus said, you've got to continue in my words so you'll find out what's really true. Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Uh, the growing, I believe, that he's talking about, as Paul says, the, the renewing of your minds. But specifically, it's our understanding 
that we can understand wh how things really are, the true nature of things, in other words. Um, here's, here's another little passage I think is good. Um, oh, you know what? Let's just, let's just talk about what is the true nature of things. What is the true reality of it? What is the, the essence of this? Well, we got I'm, I want to read this. This is the Second Corinthians. You won't mind if I read this. I think we need to read this. Uh, this is Second Corinthians chapter four. I like what Paul says here. I'm going to start with verse one. I'm actually going to uh, kind of approach this backwards. What I really want is in chapter three, but I want to preface it with what he says in chapter four. So I hope Paul won't mind if we treat his uh, chapters backwards. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Thank you, Torin. You're right on top of it. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, we have received, and as we have received mercy, we faint not. That means we don't give up. That's a constant temptation, by the way. Paul is talking about the fact that he's facing all kinds of difficulties and obstacles and problems. And, you know, if you read the book of Acts, everywhere Paul went, he'd try to preach and a riot would break out. And, you know, he tells us he was, you know, whipped and beaten with rods and they threw rocks at him. I mean, it actually says stoned, but I've got to be careful what kind of <laughs> language. He was stoned and... I, I, I know, I told you, uh, speaking out here at BJCC at the prison one night, I was reading along there, and Paul was saying, at this place I was stoned. And one of these guys said, wow, man. <laughs> that Paul is more cool than I thought. <laughs> no, that's not what we mean. They threw rocks at him, you know. That's not cool. <laughs> uh, so he's saying, you know, even though we've got all these issues and these difficulties and obstacles, every step almost there's an obstacle. He says, we don't give up. We, we faint not. And I like that because sometimes we feel like it's just, you know, one thing after another, and, but we don't give up. That's the message here. We faint not. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid... It is hid to those that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not. Now don't, uh, by the way, uh, this is just a little side thought, don't get the opposite idea from what he intends. He doesn't mean to say that the God of this world is so mighty and powerful he can just blind people's minds and make them not believe. What he's saying is people who choose not to believe, that's what happens to them. The God of this world blinds their minds. If they don't want to believe it, then their minds get blinded by the God of this world. But if they, you know, you can turn around and say, you know what, I choose to believe it. And you know what, anyone who chooses to believe the gospel, uh, the God of this world can't do anything about it. He can't blind anybody's mind who chooses to believe. So uh, I, I believe that's what he's saying. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. See, this is very much like what we've been talking about, this idea of the Logos, this uh, invisible presence that's behind everything. Uh, Jesus was made flesh and dwelt among us. It's God's perfection invading our world of imperfection. Paul uses this language. It's, it's a, like a light of the glorious gospel of Christ. He's the image of God, and he's shining uh, out like that. Verse 5, for we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. Well, thank goodness for that. We don't have to go around preaching about how great we are. <laughs> uh, we preach Christ. It's not about us. It's never been about us. It's not that we're perfect, but it's that He's perfect. Uh, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He's saying He has invaded our hearts, our inner lives, with this light of His, the knowledge of who He is and what He is and what everything about Him, the glory of God in the face of Jesus. Then he says in verse 7, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that means in a body of flesh, uh, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. 
Now, do you get the message he was conveying there that God has uh, shined into our lives, into our hearts, the knowledge of the glory of God, and it's all something that he has done inwardly. He said, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Now, let's back up. I want to read with that in mind what he says in chapter 3 right before this. Um, uh, let's go back to chapter 3, verse 12. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. Moses, when he was up on the mountain uh, in the presence of God, uh, became a partaker of the glory of God. And when he came down from the mountain, his face was glowing and it terrified the people, so he put a veil over it. But what Paul is here saying is, because Moses put a veil over his face, they couldn't tell when the glory faded out. And that, it, after a while, the glory was gone from, from Moses' face. And they didn't, they, because there was a veil, they were not able to perceive the reality. So that's the uh, example he's using. Verse 14, But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. In other words, the people that don't believe, he's speaking especially of his Jewish uh, cohorts and people he knew in his previous life, as they, don't, they read the same thing I'm reading, but they don't get it. That's what he's saying. But in Christ, you do get it. <laughs> the veil is taken away. That's what he's saying. There's no veil anymore. There's nothing between us and God. Verse 15. But even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Verse 16. Nevertheless, when it, meaning a person, when one, when, when it shall turn to the Lord, meaning when a person turns to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. He wants to be sure you get that. When a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. That means freedom. Now get this. I read all that to give you verse 18. But we all, with open face, beholding, as in a glass, the glory of the Lord. By the way, before we go on reading, do you remember what I started with in chapter 4 here, right before this? He said that, God who commanded light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. He's, you might say, implanted that in our hearts. You know, we've read from several different passages about how we're born again by the Word of God in our hearts, inwardly. And then every one of them has said, continue, receive with meekness the engrafted Word. Desire the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby as newborn babes. Here Paul is saying it a little differently. He says, but we all with open faces beholding in a glass the glory of the Lord. In other words, by looking at this very thing that he has done in our lives, a glass is a mirror, listen to what happens, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. A transformation takes place as you continue, as you look at it, as you continue to receive it as you continue to meditate upon it, as you continue to uh, feed your, you might say, your mind on it. Your, uh, James said, it's able to save your suke, your souls. Um, Jesus said, you'll find out what's really true, and it'll make you free. Well, what is it that we find out? What is it that we discover? What is this great and mighty truth? Well, it's actually a very simple truth. Let me, sh let me show it to you. Uh, this is in Galatians chapter 2. I know I quote this all the time, but it's okay. I, I want you to see it. Um, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. This is a long verse, and it's in two parts. Uh, I'm going to read the first part without comment, but the second part is where I want to... We're talking about how Jesus invades this world of imperfection and our lives of imperfection with His perfection, but then sets about changing, changing our lives, changing our minds, changing our circumstances, helping us to see what's really true. Just like Jesus in the Gospels, he knew what was really true all the time. And he was never flustered, he was never upset, he was never in fear, he was never in doubt, because he knew his Father. 
There was no veil between him and God. He knew what the truth was. What is the truth? Well, the first part of this verse is connected to what Paul was saying earlier, so I'm just going to read it and then pass on. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. That is connected to what he was saying earlier, and so I'm just going to set that aside. But what I really want to get to is the second part. Listen, and the life which I now live in the flesh. See, that's what we're talking about. In this realm of imperfection, in the flesh, what is the truth that informs our lives? Paul said, the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the reality. That's the truth. The Son of God, Jesus, loves you even in your imperfection, just as you are, just as things are, knowing about how everything is. He loves you and gave himself for you. You see, don't just read this and think, well, that's good that Paul has that relationship. No, you do too. That's what he wants you to see. Jesus loves you. You know, we've been talking about the, the logos and this Greek philosophy and this, tr this powerful truth that underlies everything. And it all sounds so high and mighty, but in reality, it's just as simple as, the, as a children's song. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. That's the truth. That's the ground and the source of our, of our security. Uh, you know, if Paul had just, if this was the only place in the New Testament we read something like this, uh, we might think, well, Paul is just getting a little bit excited, um, got beside himself. Look at Revelation chapter 1. This is written by John. By the way, we don't know if it's the same John who wrote the gospel. It's, it's somebody named John. It might be. Uh, he just says John. It's hard to know. This is a very mysterious book. Um, John, I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 1, uh, he's giving a greeting to the seven churches. He writes this revelation addressed to seven real specific churches. And then he writes in verse 5, after his greeting, he greets them, and he says in verse 5, Revelation 1, 5, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten from the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, Listen, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Uh, why does he say that? And why did, why did Paul say, the life that I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me? Uh, I believe both of them are saying this because uh, they're saying this is, this is the foundation of, of why I have confidence, why I don't worry about anything. Why, even though, like in Paul's case, facing all these problems and dilemmas and being whipped and stoned and beaten and shipwrecked. And through it all, he says, uh, Jesus loves me, gave himself for me. You know, he, it's as though he's saying, I may be having rocks hit me in the head right now, but I, what I'm thinking is, you know what? Jesus loves me, gave himself for me. This seems like a bad situation, but, you know, the one who gave himself for me and loves me, he must have uh, loved me enough that he's got some sort of a, he's got a solution for this. You know, it gave him confidence. That's why he says, I, I live, I confront all these things by faith in Jesus who loved me and gave himself for me. Um, we could sum it up this way in slightly different language. And I know this is something I quote a lot and we read it a lot, but it's still good. Uh, Romans chapter 8 uh, I'm sorry, not Romans chapter 8. Let's go to Romans 5, for, and I'm almost done. I promise you I'm, I'm finishing up here. Uh, don't be nervous. Uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 5. And hope maketh not ashamed. You know, by the way, when we read the word ashamed, we think of somebody who's embarrassed or you know, like a kid caught with their hand in the cookie jar and now he's embarrassed. That's not what it means. It means disappointed. It means, uh, uh, that's the best way to say it. And hope does not disappoint. That's what other translations say. Our hope, our confident expectation in our Father will not disappoint us 
and then there's a little semicolon and he explains the next part with the next words. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. He does not mean uh, the love of God as something that we put into practice and, and try to express with other people. Here he means God's love for us. He says, is shed abroad, <clears throat> the Amplified says, abundantly poured out uh, to fill our hearts by the Holy Spirit which is given us for when we were without strength, uh, helpless is what the Amplified says, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. You see, all of this language to do with us being helpless, but him invading our helplessness with the answer. Us being without strength, but him coming along with his love. In due time Christ died for the ungodly, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die, but God commends His love toward us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. That's just like a way of saying that God's love for us is not uh, contingent upon our perfect performance. In fact, He's sort of implying or saying directly that our performance has not been perfect. He died for us when we were sinners. In other words, He knows just exactly what kind of flawed and potentially imperfect uh, individuals we are. Yet that doesn't stop him from invading our imperfection with his perfection, uh, our helplessness with his love. You know, I, I like to use those kind of words because we can understand that sometimes, see, you, we're thinking of this in the big picture about salvation, but think about it in the little small details uh, where you feel helpless, where you feel like you don't know what to do. Like Janet was saying, when you get into traffic and, and, and you freeze up, and you're on that little stripy area of the road, and, and you can't, how am I going to get into the traffic? Well, that's a helpless feeling, isn't it? But even in that situation, he invades our helplessness with his answers, with his solution. See, that's why Paul said, the life I live in the flesh, here's how I do it, by faith in the Son of God who loved me, gave himself for me. And because the Son of God, Jesus, loves Janet and gave himself for her, he had an answer for that little situation where she's parked on that stripy part of the road. And he spoke to some people's heart and he said, you see that car there? Stop and let her in. <laughs> and they did it. That's probably some church-going Christians in that car. <laughs> I mean, I guarantee you it wasn't... Well, anyway. Yeah, you, what does it take to, to actually to even put your foot on the brake in that kind of traffic? They stopped, you know, that was, that was God's solution. That was the love of God invading our flawed, uh, don't know what to do, helpless, imperfect. It's like that with every part of our lives. That's why Jesus could walk around and never be flustered because he said he knew his father. He was never caught off guard. You know, when they, when they, when they sought to push him off the cliff, you ever read that story? And he just turned around and walked through the middle of them. You know, when they, when they slandered him and said things about him, he either was quiet or he knew what to say. He, didn't, he wasn't worried. He wasn't disturbed. When a storm came, he said, uh, says, you know, why are you so afraid? Where is your faith? Remember that? You know why he said that? Because he knew where his faith was. <laughs> the reason Paul uh, wrote and said, this life that I live in the flesh, here's how I do it, folks, by faith in the Son of God who loved me, gave himself for me. That's the reality. That's the truth that underlies uh, everything else. That is the thing that we hold on to, that we stand on. And what I started to read and what I want to conclude with in Romans chapter 8, again, this is something we've read a million times, but uh, just think of it in light of everything we've said. Verse 31. Romans chapter 8, verse 31. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Isn't that a good way to sum it up? The underlying reality is, like that children's song, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. It's just as, as plain and simple as that. And Paul says he confronts all the things that he faced with that knowledge, always first and forefront, uh, up front in his mind. Okay, I think that's all we got. Let's all stand up.